So let me let me turn to the substance of the the debate. I'm very ha uh, happy to to welcome the very expert panel that we have this evening. Uh, very glad to see you all here. The subject for tonight is decarbonised transport with or without biofuels, and I think this is a very important and, and timely su uh, subject. As you will know, uh, last year, Jose Manuel Barroso, the European Commission President, said that decarbonisation of transport would be one of his priorities for this Commission. I think it was a very significant announcement that got almost uh, uh, no real uh, discussion in the media. And it's not hard to see why this, uh, this pledge has been made by the Commission. The EU needs to make a, a sharp fall in greenhouse gas emissions across the economy by 2050, and transport will have to do its fair share. So our question for tonight is how far will biofuels be part of that low carbon future for transport? In 2007, European Union leaders set the target to get 10% of uh, uh, transport energy from biofuels, and there was a time when biofuels was very much the idea of the moment. But as the science has developed, and as some more real-world experience has come in, there have been more and more questions about biofuels. Do biofuels cause more problems than they solve? In 2008, uh, we saw, the, we saw a big spike in food prices, which the World Bank attributed to biofuels. There's also been increasing evidence about the carbon footprint of biofuels and, and evidence that some biofuels may cause more greenhouse gas emissions than they save. Of course, I've been talking about biofuels in a very loose way, but what do we mean by biofuels? There are first generation biofuels, uh, fuel that comes from, from food crops, then on the horizon, we have a second generation biofuels, and it would be interesting to hear tonight what the potential is for uh, these second generation biofuels that don't, that don't compete with food sources. But I think, and people may correct me if I'm wrong, that second generation biofuels are not expected to contribute to uh, transport fuel in a meaningful way in the short term. So in the, in the meantime, we have green safeguards, sustainability criteria for existing biofuels. These criteria are also disputed. Just this week in Brussels, there were visits from, the, uh, from ministerial delegations from Indonesia and from Malaysia, and they argue that the EU's sustainability criteria are both protectionist and could create more poverty in their countries by causing a, a source of income, a valuable source of income in palm oil to dry up. So there are lots of, lots of contentious issues here. Of course, in theory, the EU standards could become stricter. Many of you will know that the Commission is shortly to publish a study, a report on indirect effects of biofuels, or an issue known as indirect land use change, which I'm sure in the course of this debate we will define and discuss. But I'd like you to stay with the, the big picture tonight that there is a, an urgent need for the transport sector to reduce its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in, uh, in January or February next year, the European Commission will be coming forward with a white paper looking at the contribution of transport <coughs> in the next 10 years, which will include how we move to a, a decarbonized transport system. So the question I would ask is, if we were providing advice to the, the European Commission on the best way to to meet those goals, are biofuels the best bet to decarbonize transport? Are they the best option for the environment? And are they the most cost efficient way for taxpayers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? That's all I'd like to say by way of introduction. I, I'm very pleased to introduce the panel we have to debate some of these issues tonight. We're going to hear from uh, Hans van Steen of the European Commission's Energy Department. Thomas Gamesom of Abengoa Energy, sorry, Abengoa Bioenergy, which is the largest producer of bioethanol in Europe. Jos Dings from Transport and Environment, a group that is well known for its research and policy advocacy in this area. And Dr. Jeremy Woods for, of Imperial College London. But uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Jens Roda, uh, a Danish uh, Liberal MEP and uh, a member of the European Parliament's industry, 
and Energy and Research Committee. So, over to you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, I'm very happy to be given the op opportunity to address this important issue here today. Well, everybody agrees that the transport sector remains one of the most important challenges for Europe to reach our climate and resource efficiency targets. The transport sector is the sector which is finding it the hardest to break the CO2 curve with many of the new technologies being either expensive or not yet commercially viable. And the demand for mobility is not decreasing, on contrary. So we have to find solutions. And let me be clear, I believe that biofuels is a part of the mix of solutions that we need to succeed in greening our transport. In fact, we need every percentage of everything. So to reject biofuels is not an option. Firstly, biofuels represent a technology which is actually ready to use. I recognize that the first generation technology has its faults, but you need to learn how to crawl before you can walk. That is why I'm a very strong advocate for the second generation biofuels technology. This technology provides the basis for sustainable biofuels that will enable us to significantly reduce the carbon footprint of our transport sector. It will generate growth and local jobs in rural Europe. And it is based on residues from agriculture and forestry. Therefore, there's no need to change our land use patterns. Several studies show a CO2 saving rate of around 90% or above on second generation biofuels. And the biomass needed is readily available. Between 250 and 300 million tons annually. And that is according to a conservative estimate fully based on today's agricultural land use patterns. And if we go all the way and exploit the potential to the full, many jobs could be created in Europe. Of course, we should have an open debate about both the positive and negative effects of biofuels, and not least of the different technologies within the field. But I do not believe that we should roll back progress and ignore the potential. It would be throwing the baby out with the bath water. Instead, I think it is time to take the next step. The Member States' national action plans show that they will reach the 10% target with first-generation biofuels. But if there is a newer technology ensuring a more efficient and more sustainable use of biomass, ready for commercial deployment now, why not raise the bar? I suggest a specific target for second-generation biofuels to give a clear mandate for this technology as the ITRA committee actually did in 2008. I am sure it, among other initiatives, will lead us towards a greener transport sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and also for setting the good example of, of keeping to time. And now I'd like to turn to Hans van Steen of the European Commission. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and good evening to all of you. I'll try and follow this good example as far as time is concerned. Thank you for inviting the Commission to take part in this debate. And indeed, uh, decarbonisation is a priority for this Commission. As uh, you rightly said, Jennifer, it's a priority for uh, Mr Barroso and for the rest of the Commission, but it's also a very tricky issue. Uh, as we also heard from Jens Wohl, the transport sector remains the worst performing sector in greenhouse gas terms. Emissions are increasing rather than decreasing. This is the case in Europe and this is the, the case uh, worldwide. It's also a really tricky sector when it comes to our energy policy. Uh, road transport in particular relies almost exclusively on oil, the energy source on which we are most dependent on imports, and an energy source which more than any other type of energy is concentrated on 
relatively few hands, mostly in the Middle East. Therefore, there are the two dimensions. I recognize that today we're talking decarbonization, but we should not forget that there is an important energy security aspect also to our energy use in the transport sector. So will, it, will this get better? Uh, probably not. There was very disturbing news uh, this week when the IEA brought out their new World Energy Outlook, which predicts that the number of passenger vehicles globally will double between now and 2035. And they were only talking passenger vehicles. We're not even starting to look at other modes of transport. At the same time, the IEA says very clearly <coughs> that uh, world production of oil will not increase significantly in the time span up to 2035, even if we take into account oil fields which have not yet been discovered. Clearly, there is here a mismatch that we need to be very concerned about. Um, why do we believe that biofuels should play a role in our climate policy and energy policy? Because indeed that is the Commission's position and it remains the Commission's position. Well, we think they're important because biofuels can help tackle these two key challenges. Today, if we're looking at security of supply in the transport sector, there is no alternative on a large scale to biofuels in terms of diversifying sources away from oil. As far as climate change is concerned, the increase in greenhouse gas emissions in transport is growing fast. And in fact, this growth is canceling out savings being made in other sectors. As we see it at EU level, there are two policies which have the capacity to make a difference in this context. One is vehicle efficiency and the other uh, are fuel change and as I said biofuels is really the only large-scale alternative we have to oil for the moment. Therefore we think we must promote both these policies, vehicle efficiency and biofuels simultaneously. There are other ben benefits to biofuels, employment, rural development, uh, opportunities for developing countries and so on and so forth, not to mention the technological development in particular in the area of second generation biofuels. For all of these reasons, we think that the answer to the question which has been asked as a theme for this debate is clearly yes. We have already today uh, policies in place. The Renewable Energy Directive adopted in 2009 sets a 20% target for renewable energy and it says a 10% target for not biofuels but renewables in transport. That is, of course, predominantly biofuels. We also accept that very widely. Therefore, these targets will mean a significant increase in biofuels consumption. And for that reason also, the directive includes very strict criteria, probably the strictest in the world, for biofuel sustainability. It's important uh, that our measures to implement climate change and renewable energy policy do not have negative side effects of environment. Therefore, of course, when there are reports coming out claiming that biofuels do more harm than good, we study them very carefully. It's quite clear that we cannot just sit back and assume that sustainable production that will happen automatically. That is exactly why we have the criteria and we are aiming for a very strict enforcement of those criteria. The Commission is, for the moment, as you said, Jennifer, analyzing one gap in the sustainability criteria, which is that related to indirect land use change. Uh, we might come back to that later on in the debate. Uh, this is another very tricky issue. Let's be quite open about it. But there is clear that there is a potential for indirect land use change to be potentially harmful. It can cause damaging land use change. We are studying this in a very serious way. We've launched a public consultation which closed a couple of weeks ago. We had a very good response to this with more than 140 uh, responses, which we're now looking at very carefully. And we will come out with the Commission's response uh, as soon as we can. The responses, I also have to say, vary 
a lot. There are people who say, is indirect land use change a problem? Not at all. And there are others that say, yes, it is a very big problem indeed. On the question of what we should 